Homo sapiens, who are we? Where do we come from? In chapter six, we will continue our quest to learn more about our ancient ancestors on the family tree Homo. Let's continue our look at the hominin species Australopithecus afarensis with the help of paleoanthropology. Our quest takes us back to Eastern Africa to Ethiopia. We will visit a place called Akika in the Afar Triangle area near the Awash River. The Kika is just a few miles south of Hadar, Ethiopia, not far from where the fossils of the Australopithecine called Lucy were found in 1974. It was here in Dakika on December 10th of the year 2000 that Serezanai Alamsaged and his research team discovered the remains of a young Australopithecus afarensis, which Serezanai named Salam. Over 60% of the entire skeleton of Salam was recovered. Salam is thought to have been a young female Australopithecine who died at the age of three years old. She may have drowned in a flood along the Awash River. Shortly after death, her body was probably buried under sand and gravel. This would account for the recovery of so much of the skeleton of Salam. The fossil remains of Salam are dated to about 3.3 million years in the past. This makes Salam approximately 120,000 years older than the Australopithecine called Lucy. The skeletal remains of Salam pose some interesting questions. Let's see what the fossils of Salam can tell us about the state of our evolution some 3.3 million years in the past. Because Salam died at approximately three years old, her skeletal remains may help give us insight into the ontogeny or the development and growth patterns of Australopithecus afarensis. The nearly complete skull and brain cast of Salam may shed light on the growth pattern of the Australopithecine brain. Salam's brain cast indicates that her brain was slightly smaller than that of a chimpanzee at the same age. As an adult, her brain would have been larger than a chimpanzee's brain. This could be indicative of Australopithecines having an extended brain development cycle as in Homo sapiens. This longer development cycle of the brain allows a more complex brain to form outside the womb. This may indicate that young Australopithecines needed an extended period of care and nurturing similar to childhood in humans. If we look at the brain growth cycle of a human and a chimpanzee, we would find that the chimpanzee brain attains about 50% of its size in the womb. The human brain only attains about 25% of its size while still in the womb. Thus, nearly 75% of a human's brain development occurs after birth. From birth to around age five or six, a human brain grows to about 90% of its adult size. This extended childhood of Homo sapiens has been essential to our evolutionary success. It allows for complex cultural learning and interaction. During this extended growth cycle, the brain is bombarded by parental and environmental stimuli, which is crucial in acclimating the neophyte to the world in which it must live and survive. The question we have when looking at the brain development of our ancestors, such as Australopithecus afarensis, is whether they had already started down this path of increasing brain complexity. Salam seems to hint at this possibility, but only future research will help to answer this important question. Salam's remains also produced only the second hyoid bone ever recovered from one of our ancient ancestors. The hyoid bone is a tiny bone which attaches to the tongue muscles. In Salam, the hyoid bone is much more like a chimpanzee than a human. This can give us insight into Salam's vocalizations. It's likely that any sounds Salam made were more like a chimpanzee than a human. The structure of Salam's inner ear was closer to that of apes than humans. Since the inner ear plays a role in balance, this could indicate that, though Salam walked upright, she would not have been as agile and quick on her feet as members of the genus Homo. Salam's neck was short and thick, more like an ape than a human. The human neck, being slender and longer, helps stabilize the head when running. Salam's shorter neck may be an indicator that Australopithecines, while capable of walking upright, were not good long-distance runners. Salam's upper torso displays features that are adapted to tree climbing, such as long curved fingers. Salam is probably representative of a creature in transition from arboreal living to terrestrial living. Natural selection was pushing the adaptation of bipedalism while the adaptation of the upper torso followed. At 3.3 million years in the past, our ancestors were transitioning from a forested habitat to one of wooded grasslands and open savannas. As Eastern Africa began to dry out and change, our ancestors were adapting to that change. Salam represents a small snapshot in time of that transition. 
If we close our eyes, maybe we can imagine standing by a flood swollen wash river some three million years in the past. Dark storm clouds boil across the African sky. Lightning dances, ramming darkness down gullies and ravines. Trees shudder and scream. Winds howl, raking the earth. Rain sizzles and explodes off the rock face. Suddenly, a flash of lightning reveals a small group. They struggle along the banks of the river. They are seeking shelter. The young three-year-old clings to her mother. She is terrified by the storm. She screams out. The waters are rising so fast. The three-year-old slips. Her mother lunges for her. But the strength of the water is so great. They are washed away. The mother manages to grasp a limb. She clings to it with all her strength. In the roar of the darkness, she hears the screams of her daughter fading and fading. We may never know the exact details of the last seconds of Salam's life, but through the efforts of paleoanthropologists such as Zeruzani Alemsaged, our ancient ancestors like Salam can help illuminate the nature of our own life and existence. Let's now continue our look at the genus Australopithecus with a journey to Tanzania in eastern Africa. We will travel to the site of Latoli, which lies just 45 kilometers or about 28 miles south of the famous Olduvai Gorge. The site of Latoli holds some of the most interesting finds associated with the genus Australopithecus. Surprisingly, no bones are involved. What the Latoli site is famous for is its footprints. Approximately 3.6 million years ago, several of our hominid ancestors walked across an area of wet volcanic ash. They left behind a trail of footprints about 27 meters or 88 feet long. An eruption of the nearby volcano now called Sodoman had deposited a layer of volcanic ash across the countryside. Light rain had fallen on the ash layer creating a sort of muddy cement. When our ancestors walked across the area some 3.6 million years ago, their footprints were captured in the wet ash layer. Subsequent eruptions of the volcano laid down further layers of ash which helped preserve the footprints. The footprints of numerous animals were also captured in the ash layer. Gradually, erosion wore down and exposed the layer of tracks. In 1976, paleoanthropologist Andrew Hill, a member of Mary Leakey's Latoli research team, literally stumbled upon this rock layer while doing field work at Latoli. Further work at the site in 1978 by Paula Bell uncovered the hominin footprints. The most striking thing about the footprints is how human-like they appear. The tracks seem to have been laid down by a heel-strike stride pattern just as humans walk today. The big toe is in alignment with the rest of the toes as in humans. In comparison, the big toe of a chimpanzee is angled approximately 45 degrees to the other toes. The close spacing of the footprints indicates a short stride which could mean short legs. The varying size of the two sets of tracks also points to one individual being larger than the other. Several theories have been put forth over the years concerning the interpretation of the footprints since the tracks were first discovered. One of the earliest theories was that the tracks represented a male and female walking together in stride, side by side, with possibly a smaller individual following in the male's footsteps. Over the years, further study and more advanced techniques have revised the theory to two adult females walking one behind the other with a child following along on their left side. The actual sex of the individuals is speculative, but the tracks do seem to represent three individuals. The tracks have been designated G1, G2, and G3, with G1 being the trail of the smaller individual, which left the most distinct impressions. Most paleoanthropologists theorize that the footprints were most likely made by members of the species Australopithecus afarensis. Fossils of Australopithecus afarensis have been found nearby in the same sediment layer. As no other concurrent hominin species has been found, this lends credence to Australopithecus afarensis being the track maker. This ancient trail of footprints seems to indicate that bipedalism was well established in our ancestors some 3.6 million years in the past. The fossils of Salam and Lucy seem to testify to what the Latoli footprints reveal. Our ancestors in the genus Australopithecus afarensis were adapting to the changing environment in eastern Africa. Natural selection was pushing bipedalism in the lower body. The upper body was following as it adapted to the new dynamics created by bipedalism. 
of these new dynamics, freeing of the hands may be the most important. With the hands free to take on new tasks, natural selection could push the upper body and the brain in new and more complex directions. On that day, in the distant past, some 3.6 million years ago, as our ancestors walked across that stretch of muddy volcanic ash, leaving behind only their footprints, the earliest beginnings of our own genus Homo lay over a million years in the future. The beginning of our own species, Homo sapiens, lay some 3.4 million years in the future. When we gaze at the footprints today and look back on that day some 3.6 million years gone by, we contemplate what our ancient ancestors must have been like. And if we thought about it, we might muse on the fact that we are the only species on the planet capable of that contemplation. In Chapter 7, we will continue our look at our ancestors in the genus Australopithecus and what role they played in the evolution of our own genus Homo with the help of paleoanthropology.